Zoe Uno, and I'm located in the Regional Medical Library of the National Network of Libraries in Medicine for the Pacific Southwest region in California. And Rebecca Brown from the NTO is joining me. Um, today we'll have an overview of citizen science and look at example projects and NLM resources and other resources that you can use in your libraries and institutions to support the efforts of citizen, citizen scientists. First, let's uh, have an overview of our objectives for today. So at the, um, dur during this webinar, we'll describe different aspects of citizen science and share specific examples of health-related projects. We'll explain ways that librarians and libraries can get involved with citizen science and identify resources and funding opportunities. We'll also uh, discuss some of the challenges that people may encounter. As a reminder, or for those who are new to our webinar, um, the National Library of Medicine is the world's largest biomedical library. It maintains and makes available a vast collection and produces electronic resources on a wide range of topics that are searched billions of times each year by millions of people around the globe. It also supports and conducts research, development, and training in biomedical informatics and health information technology. NLM's offerings are vast, and the library is open to the public. You might recognize some of the products. Um, for one, the exhibit series, and resources like PubMed and ToxNet and more. Okay, someone is saying that they cannot hear me. Um, I, I will look at the chat box, okay. sorry. Thank you. Um, and we'll talk more about those resources uh, over this hour. Okay, so in addition, the library coordinates a over 7,000 member national network of libraries in medicine that promote and provide access to health information in communities across the U.S. The mission of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine is to advance the progress of medicine and improve public health by providing all U.S. health professionals with equal access to biomedical information and improve public access to information to enable them to make informed decisions about their health. The program is coordinated by the National Library of Medicine and carried out through a, nat a nationwide network of health science libraries and information centers. I encourage you to um, contact your regional medical library if you've not uh, already been in touch and see what resources and services are available to you. Remember that membership is free and um, the RMLs provide trainings both in person and online and other services that are useful to educators and librarians. So what does the NLM do? Or how do we carry out our mission of advancing progress of medicine and improving public health? Well, um, as I stated, we provide in-person and online training. Um, we also exhibit at conferences and health fairs. And we provide funding to our member libraries, as well as uh, other activities. Hey, Zoe, so, it's Rebecca. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. But I want to get Felicia's attention if I can, because it looks like the captioner cannot hear. Okay. 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 So hopefully, Felice just heard me. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, no problem. Um, did you want me to go ahead and continue? Yes. Okay. So now that I've provided some background on NLM, and in NLM, we'll dive into our discussion about citizen science. Um, so this image comes from an example of citizen science that I'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, so here's an opportunity for our, our um, attendees to participate. So if you could put your response in the chat box, that would be great. In your opinion, what is citizen science? And just in case, um, 
<laughs> want to state again. Oh, there we go. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you um, for participating. Um, and there'll be a few other opportunities to do so as well. Okay, so citizen science is the intersection of existing research projects, technology, and public participation. And it is a data collection activity. There are a lot of great um, definitions of citizen science. And one way to, to look at it is citizen science is usually um, involving the three components that are illustrated on the screen. And um, the Citizen Science Association defines citizen science as the involvement of the public in scientific research, whether community-driven research or global investigation. If we uh, consider some additional um, information for this definition. SciStarter, which is a resource we'll talk about a little later, notes that there are four key features of citizen science practice. First, anyone can participate. Next, participants use the same protocol so data can be combined and is high quality. Third, data can help scientists come to real conclusions and last, a wide community of scientists and volunteers work together and share data to which both the public and scientists have access. Another good way to think of citizen science is by what it is, it, what it is not, and it's not participating in a medical trial or a social science survey. So citizen science happens in many disciplines. So that takes us to our next question. What disciplines can citizen science be found in? So when you think about citizen science, what are some disciplines where you, you think you might find citizen science? All right, great. Thank you all for your responses. And these are all examples. You've given a number of examples of where we might um, encounter citizen science. So in the social sciences, um, astronomy, ecology and environmental, um, health sciences. Uh, we see lots in, in biology. Um, we see them in technology. Uh, we see them in space exploration. So there are a lot of, of opportunities for people to participate, uh, regardless of what their favorite discipline is. So our next question is, have you participated in a citizen science project before?
Oh, great. So I've seen that some people have, um, some people have not, and I'm getting some not yet responses. So I'm, I'm happy to see that people are planning to participate um, if they've not done so. Okay, so um, citizen science should uh, benefit all parties involved. Um, and there are, are benefits, to, uh, there are global benefits as well. Um, it's important that we review some of the key principles of citizen science to understand some of the potential risk associated. This list of 10 principles was put together by the European Citizen Science Association. Okay. So the first principle, new knowledge. Citizen science projects will result in new knowledge, or they should. Um, principle two, there should be a genuine science outcome, so that people are not just collecting data just for the sake of collecting data, but there's going to be an outcome to the research that's being done. Principle three, everyone should benefit, the participants, the scientists, and the public. Principle four, participation should be encouraged at all stages of the research, research process, not just data collection. Principle five, citizen scientists should be able to know how their data are used and what might result from that data collection. Principle six, there are limitations and biases to consider, but citizen science allows for greater democratization. Um, seven, data and results should be open access. Principle eight, if ci citizens work on projects, they should be acknowledged for their work. Um, principle nine, programs should be evaluated. And principle 10, carefully consider the legal and ethical issues surrounding projects. So these should always be taken into consideration. And we're not addressing um, the legal and ethical issues, but if you look um, at the Citizen Science Associations, they do have information on um, legal and, and ethical issues that should be considered um, when participating in citizen science projects or when developing a citizen science project. So the 10 principles that um, I just reviewed, a number of them were considered in this consensus study report that was generated by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, in November of 2018, the Board on Science Educated it released this report. Um, that says that citizen science is positioned to support participant learning about science. And the report identified ways that citizen science projects can be designed to effectively support learning. And I've listed some of the key findings from that report. Um, the first being that to intentionally design the research to support participant learning. And this can be done by knowing who the audience is, and employing proven strategies during the design to support participant learning. Um, they also found that it's important to intentionally design for diversity. So taking into, consider, into consideration the, the wide range of participants who are likely to participate in citizen science projects and what sort of learning outcomes they'll take away from that participation. So we're not going to um, go into any detail in, about the report, but I encourage you to take a look at it if you're, you have interest about those findings and um, the other information that they developed while uh, discussing or creating this report. And that Rebecca has put the link in the chat box so you have that available um, to you. OK, so many people are. Um, Familiar with citizen science projects because we're seeing them more in the news media. So um, we're revisiting one of the pictures that I showed earlier in the slides. Um, and this is a project where the researcher built a tool 
that anyone could use to help monitor bleaching of coral in the oceans. So this research also looks um, at uh, the results of, of 40 satellites that are operating and um, passing over the reefs and monitoring the pro what's happening. But recognizing that there are a number of people who are diving and are out in the oceans um, surround, surrounded by the coral, they, he wanted to have a, a process where they could participate easily. And so his lab built a tool so that, um, or a website that allows users to report bleaching by dragging a pen on a map to um, indicate where they spotted damage. So they can indicate whether bleaching they saw was light, medium, or severe. And um, the website also included instructions on how to tell the difference. And that way, divers and swimmers were able to help participate in monitoring what's going on in the, um, the ocean. And so this is uh, an area in Hawaii that's being bleached. Okay, so here's another example of a citizen science project in Hawaii. Um, this was published in 2016, but I included this because it shows the impact of citizen science participation. So um, citizens were monitoring the pollution that was seen in the beach, and based on the findings, um, re regulations were put in place to try to clean up the coastline so that um, ultimately the people who participated saw an impact from their, from their participating in this project. Okay, so um, again, looking at the different types of projects there are, this is a zoological project. So um, the Bumblebee Discovery Project was a 2014 initiative in the UK. And it shows how um, studies and scientists get involved in zoology. And this one was aimed to engage children and their parents with STEM subjects by enabling them to take part in observing and recording bumblebees visiting flowers. Okay, and, and so this is important to monitor what's going on with the health of the bee population, which is very important to the health of um, the plants that they pollinate. Here's another example. This is an astronomy project. And amateur astronomers help discover new worlds from the comfort of their computer screen. The Planet Hunters Project on Zooniverse trained volunteers how to find undiscovered planets by looking at how the brightness of a star changes over time by reviewing publicly available Kepler telescope data. This project was so successful that they found five confirmed new planets and many other potential candidates. This project is um, in its second phase and still ongoing. Another project, um, this is an environmental project, and it was inspired by Pokemon Go. The Stream Tracker project recruited people to check in on small streams in their area and report back basic information. So in the image, um, in the article, on the left, you'll see that there's no water flowing. But on the right, that same spot a year later, you have flowing water. So it helps to um, indicate what's happening with the water in the different regions. And this is a project um, that was published over the weekend in USA Today. And it's a naturalist project. And um, what you're looking at is a large sunfish, um, which is also the specific species is the hoodwinker. And it's normally not found in the range where it was located. And as a result, um, people went out and, and started taking pictures of it and then um, started inputting data that they had taken over the years. So um, hoodwinkers are normally not found in California. But it's possible that the hoodwinker 
sunfish wanders quietly and sightings off the west coast of North America are of occasional strains. But we don't know if these odd sightings are a relatively new thing, perhaps linked to warming oceans and changing ocean currents. So um, for this project, sorry, people used the iNaturalist app, which you can uh, download on your phone and go out and take pictures of what you observe. And then a scientist asked that people, um, what, she could go in and look at those images and follow, um, monitor the different fish to see if they were looking at the same fish or if new fish were coming in and monitor what their movements are in the ocean. And so that helps to uh, try to gain some understanding of what's happening with the ocean currents and, and possible um, connections to climate change. Okay, and now uh, for a health project. So um, this project aims to develop models that can help predict outbreaks of mosquito-borne illnesses. So to take part in this NASA crowdsourcing effort, people download Globe Observer app onto their smartphones and input data on mosquito location through the Mosquito Habitat Mapper tool. That information can then be funneled into a global database for scientists to use and public health authorities to use to try to manage the risk of disease in their communities. And this was um, published in the San Antonio Express News in 2018. And so um, this is a project that's also still ongoing. Okay, so those are just some examples of citizen science program, uh, projects that people can participate in. So now I'm going to talk um, specifically about some NLM-related uh, citizen science programs. So um, one program I'll talk about is SciStarter and uh, the NLM per, uh, partnership. So SciStarter is an online community dedicated to improving citizen science for project managers and participants. And they're over, um, they have over 3,000 projects and events that are searchable on their website. You can search by location, project, um, scientific topic, age level. And people join SciStarter, and members track their contributions and provide feedback. SciStarter also supports researchers in managing projects, including best practices for engaging participant partners. Now on this slide, I bring your attention to the Citizen Science Month page. Citizen Science Month is an annual event to celebrate and promote citizen science. The discoveries, the volunteers, the hardworking practitioners, the projects, and anything else citizen science related. The celebration includes events hosted by libraries, institutions, community groups, museums, and individuals all around the world. Now, on this specific page, you can learn more. Um, you can find events that are near you. You can find out about Citizen Science Month and what is citizen science. And if you're facilitating a citizen science project or event, you can register your event, find event resources, sign up for planning and updates as well. So there's a host of information available if you're considering participating in Citizen Science Month. Now on this page, there's a featured event. And um, the featured event that I've called up is one that's happening um, this upcoming weekend, and it's Citizen Science Fest 2020. And um, as you can see, it's anywhere on the planet. So you, you can participate from wherever you are. You can encourage people to participate from wherever they are. They can come into your libraries and participate. So um, they describe it as join students around the world in a citizen science festival, complete any citizen science project, create a one-minute video showcasing your work, and upload it to a global flip grid to share with the world. So this is a, a kid-friendly science festival activity that anyone can participate in as long as they have access to create a video um, and upload that video. So your library may be able to participate in this way. 
On that same page, you'll find Featured Projects. And um, on the rotating slideshow, you'll see that they're highlighting the National Library of Medicine and SciStarter and the six projects that they are supporting for Citizen Science Month. Okay, so if you click on that link, that takes you to the page um, where you will find the six projects. So the NNLM has partnered with NIH, um, the All of Us Research Program, to highlight citizen science as a way to increase involvement of people living in the U.S. in scientific research as a way to reduce some of the barriers between health researchers, research, and the public. The collaborations between communities and researchers build capacity to address problems and meet research goals. And the partnership aims to foster better understanding of health data and its use in an increasingly data-driven world. The NLM provides access to a variety of resources for basic health, environmental health, and genetics that can support citizen science outreach and efforts in your community. So um, you can contact your regional medical library to learn more, and you, if you're on our listservs, you may be hearing from some libraries about these um, Citizen Science Month and these projects that are being supported. So um, I wanted to highlight one of the projects for you. So you'll see that you have Globe at Night, Flu Near You, Debris Tracker, I See Change, Stall Catchers, and Crowd the Tap. So these are different um, citizen science projects that were selected for libraries to, um, to participate in during the Citizen Science Month. Okay, so flu near you, and, and then I saw in the chat box that that was one that someone had previously participated in. But it was created by epidemiologists from Harvard and Boston Children's Hospital and leverages the power of the crowd to provide um, you and researchers real-time information about influenza-like illness in the area. So Flu Near You relies on voluntary participation of individuals who take a few seconds each week to share if they have been healthy or sick. And they analyze the thousands of individual reports and map them to generate local and national views of influenza-like illness. And um, just for your personal peace of mind, flu near you is free and confidential. So scientists use this information um, in the reports to map them to generate local and national views. So um, this is, is a project that you may want to promote in your library so that people can participate. Um, there's a very low uh, time commitment in order to do so. But it provides valuable information about the spread of flu during flu season. Okay, so I um, came back to this page to highlight another project, and that's Stall Catchers. So Stall Catchers was the project that was identified last year um, through the citizens through the SciStarter and NNLM um, partnership. So um, SciStarter, with support from the National Network of Libraries and Medicine, Pacific Southwest Region, and Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation and Society, activated over 30 public libraries in a megathon. And their goal was to galvanize libraries as hubs for citizen science. And many, many of these libraries participated in the Megathon live stream on April 13th. And at the end of the weekend, citizen scientists had accomplished over 2,500 research hours, or the equivalent of three and a half months of lab equivalent research time. So this gives you an indication of how um, citizen scientists are contributing to research efforts of the projects that they uh, participate in. Okay, and so this was a headline in Discover um, in May 2019. 
so shortly after the event, um, citizen scientists had set a new record for accelerating Alzheimer's research. Okay, so then um, just to further indicate the impact of libraries and their users participating in citizen science, Stall Catchers ended up being the most viewed project on SciStarter in 2019. It also was the most joined project on SciStarter in 2019. And it had the most contributions on SciStarter in 2019. So again, I share this as an indication of how libraries can positively contribute to citizen science projects. So it'll be interesting to see the numbers um, on the six projects that were selected for this year. OK, so this takes us to um, looking at the library as a citizen science hub. So when you think of citizens participating in citizen science, um, you think about how to recruit them. You think about what they will actually do. So um, public libraries are promoting citizen science. They're providing resources and collections so that their, use, their visitors have access to the materials that they'll need in order to participate in, in those projects. An, an easy way for libraries of any type is to act as a hub. And this is true for public libraries, school libraries, community college, and academic libraries. Okay, and so this slide shows uh, examples of two different libraries. One is the Portland Public Library in Maine, which has a citizen science page that shares resources in the community and related information. And um, North Carolina State University Library has a citizen science club and presence on campus. Another um, way is for libraries to build collections. And those collections can include books as well as materials that um, the citizen scientists will use in collecting data. Now I also include another example. And this is the San Diego Public Library. And they offer a series of citizen science lectures and an expo where visitors can learn more about projects in the area. And um, this is actually an upcoming lecture. And it appears to be um, a monthly lecture series. And so what you, you see is that uh, they bring in scientists to talk about their, their work. And again, um, people learn how they can contribute. This slide uh, shows um, the availability of kits in circulation in public libraries. And so this was part of a pilot project in six Phoenix area libraries. Um, and this slide was provided by Dan Stanton and Darlene Cavalier, who um, they're uh, at uh, University of Arizona, as well as uh, work with uh, SiteStarter. But it gives you an idea of the types of, of resources that are available in the kits that they make available. Another resource I want to bring your attention to is the SciStarter um, has a resource for librarians and facilitators page. And on this page, you'll find access to the Librarian's Guide to Citizen Science. And so this has a lot of uh, resources available. It provides a general introduction, explores ways libraries can, can be a partner in citizen science engagement, and um, provides information on access to resources that you can use to help people learn about citizen science projects and connect existing programs and communities to projects on SciStarter. And if you download this guide, it also has details for planning Citizen Science Month events 
and tools for sustaining ongoing engagement in citizen science. And so as an example, I showed you that the San Diego Public Library does have ongoing um, active or programming to support citizen science. The guide also includes some examples of partnerships. And so um, here are two. Uh, one is libraries. And this, uh, the one on the left is the Los Angeles Public Library collaborating with Globe Learning and Observations. And the one on the right is the example of a museum. So this is the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County um, collaborating with the Los Angeles County Library to prototype, prototype community science kits. So these are just two examples of um, partnerships that are taking place to promote engagement in citizen science projects. OK. so so. We've covered a lot of information so far. And um, I just wanted to check in to see if we had any questions, um, any comments before I go on to the next portion where we'll talk about the National Library of Medicine um, resources. OK, great. All right, so um, when we have such a diverse range of participants in citizen science, it's important to make citizen science initiatives. It's important to make sure that they have access to resources that can help them better understand the concepts and ideas that they'll encounter in those projects. And LM has several different resources that can be useful for citizen scientists. And so we'll take a look at those resources that you'll want to visit and explore to see what sorts of information is available there. So the first one I want to uh, bring your attention to is the Environmental Health Student Portal. Um, a lot of citizen science initiatives focus on environmental change. And the environmental, the environmental Health Student Portal is a useful resource designed for students and teachers in grades 6 to through eight. And they can learn how the environment impacts our health. The website explores topics such as water pollution, climate change, air pollution, and chemicals. This site is written at a middle school level, and its resources are accessible to individuals of all abilities. And you can use the site to introduce topics, supplement existing materials, or further explore the connection between human activities and the environment and how these activities affect our health. Okay, so I wanted to point out that um, there is a section specifically for teachers. And that's the, um, the tab on the far right. You'll see that it says for teachers. And in this section, there are free lesson plans activities, project ideas, and resources that citizen scientists can use when investigating environmental health. Okay, the next resource I want to bring to your attention is Talkstown. And Talkstown provides consumer level information on everyday locations and situations where you might be exposed to toxic chemicals. This site will help you better understand risk of exposure, potential health effects, and how to protect yourself. Again, many citizen science projects involve environmental health. So it's, it's worth uh, checking out this resource so that you know what types of information are available that um, can be used for environmental health concepts. Okay, and this is. Um, Features of Talkstown include um, glossaries to understand key concepts and terms related to environmental health and toxicology, guides and toolkits that will help you to take action to minimize exposure, um, the ability to find resources for making the connection between environment and health in the classroom or library, and guides, toolkits, and teaching resources that are all um, free and relevant to those environmental health issues that 
um, are a, a part of many citizen science projects. Okay, a resource that I use often is genetics home reference. Um, citizen scientists who are interested in genetics research can find lots of information uh, by visiting genetics home reference. It provides consumer friendly information about the effects of genetic variations on human health and is an excellent supplemental tool to get people started or as a refresher to learning about human genetics and inherited disorders. It has browsable information about conditions, genes, the 23 pairs of human chromosomes, and mitochondrial DNA. And the resource also includes a glossary of medical and genetics definitions, as well as links to other genetics information and organizations. If your library has programming around family health or genetic testing, Genetics Home Reference is a resource that you'll want to share and um, investigate and have familiar familiarity with. One thing that I want to highlight is um, you can find it under the Help Me Understand Genetics tab. And this is a printable version of the entire Help Me Understand Genetics handbook. This uh, handbook includes illustrations. And some of the popular sections are what is DNA, what is a gene mutation, and how do mutations occur what kinds of mutations are possible, how many chromosomes do people have, and what are proteins and what do they do. So again, I uh, encourage you to explore this resource to find out what type of uh, information is available there for when those genetics questions um, pop up. Okay, the next resource is ChemID Plus, and this is a good resource for people who are engaged in citizen science chemistry uh, projects. Uh, ChemID Plus helps you locate information on over 400,000 chemicals and includes synonyms and structures for those chemicals. The advanced search lets users draw their own structures. So over on the right, you'll see an example of that. And perform chemical similarity and substructure searches and search by any combination of name, registry number, molecular formula, classification code, locator code, toxicity, physical property, structure, or molecular weight. And when I was um, teaching um, chemical chemical literacy, um, this was a resource that I would use in the classroom. So this is a really good uh, resource for you. Okay, the next one is Household Products Database. And this database links over 18,000 consumer brands to health effects from safety data sheets. Um, and you may formally know these as material safety data sheets. And these are provided by the manufacturers. And they allow scientists and consumers to research project, products based on chemical ingredients. It is designed to help answer questions like what are the chemical ingredients and their percentage in specific brands, which products contain specific chemical ingredients, what are the acute and chronic effects of chemical ingredients in a specific brand are just some of the questions that you can answer by using it. OK, so this slide um, is an example of um, a hazard statement and chemical ingredients for items that were searched. You'll notice that it also provides bubble charts by product type to give you an idea of the most common products of each type that are included. This resource can be used to tie chemical concepts back into, into products familiar to citizen scientists. So you'll see things here like weed control and lawn turf and um, cleaners, 
So all materials that people are accustomed to using in their personal life. Okay, so one more resource I want to share is the Kids Environment, or the, um, sorry, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And this page is the Kids Environment, Kids Health. And this resource is for, is for children, parents, and teachers to find fun educational materials related to health, science, and the environment. You can explore by topic, find games, and fun activities and lessons to incorporate into your programming. There are also a variety of free lesson plans on health topics like children's health, genetics, indoor air quality, and mold, as well as other topics. Okay, so just to take a quick pause, um, are there other resources that people might have used in relation to citizen science projects or um, environmental health questions that they've received in the library? So can you think of other NLM, NIH um, resources that you might consider using? And I didn't say this earlier, but we, in addition to Rebecca making the links available during, in the chat box, um, we'll also make the links available when we post the video after the um, session. So you'll have access to all the resources that we talked about. Okay. See, well, moving on. So a, a challenge that you may encounter is funding your citizen science programming or toolkits that you make or um, activities that you might make available in your library. So if you want to get involved in a citizen science project and require funding, here are some ideas of where to get started. So each NNLM region offers outreach and technology awards each year. And if you're working on a program that will have some health or environmental health impact, your RML is a good place to look for funding. So reach out to your, re your regional office if you have questions about what might be allowed. So as you're, as you're thinking about your project, um, it's a good idea to reach out and find out what types of, of projects we may fund. You can also look on our websites to see what sorts of projects have been funded in the past to give you an idea of what types of activities receive funding. Um, another resource is the Foundation Center. And um, it can help you see who funds library projects. And you can check to see if funding is available through your state library or your regional library system. And depending upon the type of project you're interested in, federal agencies offer larger awards for outreach and citizen science programming. And one that we didn't list, but uh, one that you might consider is the um, IMLS uh, grant. Oh, I just looked at the chat box and saw an update that Rebecca had provided. Okay, so another um, uh, potential challenge it might be finding partners. So um, you may want to participate in citizen science projects or programming and are not sure where to start. So we've given you a, a number of ideas during this webinar. But you also wa uh, want to look to see if programs already exist in your local area. So potential partners are museums. So as, as uh, noted earlier, the Natural History Museum and the LA Public Library have a partnership. Um, then you have your science centers, as well as parks and academic institutions, after school programs, and camps. So there are strong examples out there of partnerships between uh, science departments, local nature centers, museums, and so on. And many of these organizations benefit from the skills, resources, and reach of a library partner. So think about um, what's available in your area and who you might be interested in, in uh, reaching out to. 
And again, just for a quick check, does anyone um, have a potential partner in mind that they plan to reach out to, um, maybe to see what they're doing for Citizen Science Month? Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for sharing. And if you um, think of other par potential partners, please feel free to um, enter them into the box as long as the, uh, we're still on. All right. So earlier I mentioned um, libraries uh, as resources through their collections. So um, here are just a few titles that you may want to consider for your collection. So the first three items are books that are available. Um, and I also want to bring your attention to an online open access journal, uh, Citizen Science Theory and Practice. So these articles are freely available. Um, and they give you some more information about the theory of citizen science projects. So uh, one example here is promoting data collection in pollinator citizen science projects. So you, you can read a bit more and, and get some more information about um, citizen science. The one underneath that is, what do we know about young volunteers, an exploratory study of participation in the universe? So this is a, a good resource for, for finding out information about um, citizen science projects and the research that's being done around those projects. OK. Um, and then lastly, this is a list of additional places to find information about citizen science. So there are, are the citizen science associations. Um, sitsci.org. There's a citizen science discussion list that you might want to join. And there's um, a citizen science conference. And I don't believe that it's annually. It may be um, every other year. But you can take a look um, to find out when the next conference is taking place and where that conference will be located. OK. Um, so lastly, here's my contact information. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel. Select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.